over 3,000 people here, and this is very exciting. And we, of course, have a great guest speaker coming up next, a keynote speaker, one of our own. Extremely important keywords, moments to momentum. Moments to momentum. Think about that when we listen to James Curley. James Curley is from Nova Scotia, but he's been the vice president, he is the vice president, executive vice president and president of global brands for Levi's. Levi's, <laughs> Levi's house company. And when he comes up, you'll notice everything he's wearing, of course, he's got Levi's on him, which is exciting. Monsieur Curley, qui uh, est d'une famille, son père était un pilote de hélicoptère. Et puis, bien sûr, il a voyagé partout en Amérique du Nord, des pays bas. Et il a eu toutes sortes d'expériences importantes. Et ensuite, il a étudié, bien sûr, du côté exécutif à Stanford et Harvard. Donc, il a énormément d'expérience. But, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Curley is not only a Nova Scotian, he's a great friend to our Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau. And he has played an important role in that vision building. And he's the type of person that will take moments like this that we're living today and make it into a major momentum. And we know, we know what we want. We want him to tell us how he's going to take all these special moments and bring us to victory on new October 21st, 19, 2019. 2019, he will share his opinion how he's going to make, help us become the continued important government that we have been. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm extremely happy to introduce Mr. James Curley to the stage. Come gather round people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown But accept it and soon you'll be drenched to the bone For if your time to you is worth saving You better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are a-changing Ho ho ho, who wrote that 50 years ago? Bob Dylan, right? And think about today, think about Right now, the times are changing. And we have to understand that during certain eras, certain times, certain moments, that we have to change as well. But you didn't think you were coming here for a physics lesson on momentum, did you? But I'm gonna take you back to physics. Maybe 300 years before Bob Dylan wrote The Times They Are Changing, there was another guy with long hair named Sir Isaac Newton. And he started with physics. And he created, developed, and communicated the laws of physics and the laws of motion. And I think they apply to us. The first law of motion says, as an, an object at rest tends to stay at rest until you apply force. Basically, in simple terms, if you do nothing, nothing happens. Hmm. The second law of physics says force equals mass times acceleration. How big you are and how fast you go determines the type of momentum you can create. And then the third law kicks in. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Hmm. Physics. Momentum. I want to talk to you today about how do you turn moments into momentum. I don't come today with a political agenda. I come with an experience agenda and a future agenda. Before we get into moments to momentum, let me tell you my story, my Canadian story. It started right here. This is my grandfather, an immigrant, early last century, out of the United Kingdom, was an orphan and at 17 years old, 
read on a little poster on a light post, come to the new frontier and join the Northwestern Mounted Police. He got on a boat one way and became assistant commissioner of the RCMP. That was the starting point. He had a son born in Aklavik, Northwest Territories, otherwise known as my dad, Brigadier General Colin Curley. Based here is the Maritime Air Commander in Halifax, and in fact, if you want to go way back, he actually flew the very first Sea King into Shearwater in 1963. And I think they're still flying today. <laughs> but then, behind every amazing story of my grandfather in the RCMP, my father as a general, and he would describe himself around the world as we grew up and we lived in many countries around the world, um, he often would describe himself and introduce himself as a peacekeeper. And he would say to people, I spent almost 40 years in the Canadian military as a peacekeeper. And I remember as a kid always being proud that he could associate that dynamic of peace and at the same time know that he was a pretty cool helicopter pilot and we got to do cool things when we were kids. But behind all that was this amazing woman and is this amazing woman, my mother, Nancy Curley from Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. She was on the same track as Anne Murray, as you can tell, from Spring Hill, and decided to, you know, go big time, and my mom decided to, you know, roll with my dad and have a little fun around the world. And she still today resides in Parsboro, Nova Scotia, and is amazing. And as I heard Tarek's amazing speech about his coming to Canada and making it his home in modern day refugee movements and how Canada supported that, it took me back to uh, about 30 years ago uh, when my mother was one of the central players in Operation Lifeline during the refugee crisis from Indochina when we referred to them as the boat people. And I can remember often in our home in Toronto when we were living there, strangers would show up, we'd give them shelter, and then we'd provide access and connections through Operation Lifeline. So my, my mother continues to be a force on this earth from Parsboro, Nova Scotia. And then, of course, I get asked when I go around the world, Are, so you're from Canada, how, how do you uh, prove it? So I don't have the backpack with the maple leaf, but I, I could pull out my passport and show people. I could talk to them about where I'm from. Uh, but there's one photo I have which just captures it all. In 2010, Vancouver Olympics, I got to hang out with the world's best, fastest gold medal tobogganist, John Montgomery. Remember that? Oh, and I also got to watch the hockey game, gold medal hockey game. One of my favorite Canadian moments was, and if you remember that game, it went into overtime. 26 seconds left, Canada was about to win the gold. We were on the literally edge of our seats. There's me and my brothers, and we're like, this is awesome. We're gonna win gold, 2010. Boom, USA scores to tie it up. Now most countries would have done this, oh, oh, I can't believe it, we almost won. I looked around and I saw every single person Every single person do this. More hockey! <laughs> We're gonna play more hockey! And of course, as it goes on, golden goal scored by none other than Sid Crosby from Nova Scotia. <laughs> so let's turn to the topic of turning moments into momentum. As mentioned, I don't have a political agenda, I have an experience agenda along my journey, and I just want to share a few thoughts and ideas as you go on your journey to shape the future of Canada. It's interesting, at Levi Strauss, we invented the blue jean, and right around the same time that happened, there was a country being formed called Canada, a 150-year-old country. And when I was in Canada Day last year in Ottawa, I started thinking about Canada is not 150 years old, it's 150 years young. It's a young country in relative terms. And then I started thinking about, wow, well, what did I apply at Levi's? And I, at Levi's, when I got there six years ago, I said, why don't we become the 150-year-old startup? Why? Because if you can take the heritage and the earned authenticity over 150 years and have the same energy and focus for the future as a startup and create that positive collision, good things might happen. And I think Canada's in a similar position. 
So let's go on a little journey on a few things that I've learned along the way that just might spark some ideas. It might be interesting, and it might be put into use as you go on your journey towards 2019. The starting point is often about possibilities. What's possible? What can we hope for? What, what do we think could happen? But then we realize we have to create scenarios. From scenarios, you turn and go, wow, we're facing obstacles all over the place. And how do you take those obstacles and turn them into opportunities? And then you get together and you create strategies. From those strategies, you derive an expectation of results. That's kind of how it happens. And whether it's your movement, whether it's a business, a brand, these are the dynamics that get put into play in places like this right now. So as we go on the journey, here's some things to think about. I often get asked, is it vision or execution? Which one matters most? If you think about it, vision without execution is really just a dream. And if you can't execute against that, nothing really gets done. If you think about the context of the journey you're going on, vision becomes the reason. It becomes the hope. And the execution gets done through hard work. And when those come together, vision and execution, powerful things happen. So it has to be the vision and the execution. You're going to hear a lot about that over the next few days. When it comes to this dynamic of do we draw on the past, the iconic past, or do we try to innovate dynamics for the future, the answer is do both. Canada as a country has never been better positioned to draw on its heritage and its authenticity as a country, as a nation, as a community, and as a culture than right now today. I can tell you when I go around the world, and invariably it comes up, what do you do, where do you live, where are you from? I have never been more proud to call myself Canadian than I am right now today. And if you think about the opportunity to innovate, sometimes it comes with a big eye, a big innovation movement. And other times it's a lot of little innovations that come together to move forward. It can be technology related. It can be environmentally related. It can be community related, business or brand. But getting that balance of heritage and modernity, of iconic and innovation, I think is something that Canada is perfectly positioned to do. And it's on the journey. This is an interesting one for me that I've learned is we often say, do you, do you try to protect the core that you've built or do you expand for more? Hmm. You've seen those situations, whether it's in a political sense or whether it's in a business or brand sense, where, where people left their core and they moved somewhere else and they didn't quite connect to the more and they're left in the middle, the awkward, mediocre middle. But if you can get a sense of saying, let's protect the core and expand for more, good things start to happen. From my point of view, it was pretty straightforward. There are a lot of people that grew up with Levi's. And they're loyal, they've never left us. Keep them right in Levi's, a pair of Levi's. There were a lot of people that loved us and left us. We have to get those fans back. And the most exciting part for me about the future is there's a new generation that didn't grow up with Levi's, but when they put on a pair of Levi's, we connect and they tend to stay with us for a long time because of authenticity. Does it sound familiar? Those that have been loyal, loved you but left you, you're introducing them to it? Hmm. Think about that in the context of your journey. How do you protect your core and knowingly expand for more? And there's another dynamic that hits here too, which is really interesting in my conversations with some of you around the use of insights and of data and of understanding how to use that information not for information's sake, but to synthesize it into action. I'll give you a small story about insights from a blue jeans perspective. I've never seen any of your closets before, but I know that you spend between five and 7% of your dollars on a pair of jeans in your closet. 
right? Hmm. So when I say, oh, we're the worldwide leader of 7% of your closet, it doesn't sound so aspirational, does it? But if you think about how do you create a vision, if I said, what if we looked at not about share of blue jeans, but what if we talked about share of closet? And you open your mind up to what's possible for your brand or your business or your movement. Understanding how to take that data and insights, articulate it, and then create a vision beyond that is important. And you will have, I believe, the information to derive those insights, but how you then turn that into the vision is gonna be more relevant. This is an interesting one for all of us. As a country, Canada is democratic. People's voices are heard. It's inclusive, it's diverse. This is the access part of it, providing accessibility for voices to be heard and for individuals to matter. And collectively, when individuals come together, they start movements. And movements turn into momentum. Momentum takes you to places that you envisioned. Providing access has never been more important in terms of bringing things together. At the same time, there has to be an aspirational hope behind that access to make sure as this comes together, there's a vision beyond just tomorrow to provide aspiration to those that are creating a movement. Getting the balance of accessibility and aspiration right, I think whether it's for Levi's or whether it's for a movement in Canada, I think there's something there. This is one of my favorites. And as you start thinking about the youth movement, as you start thinking about life, as you start thinking about the individuals you're going to intersect with, it gets really interesting. Because you have very few moments to actually make them matter. And in today's world, let's face it, everybody has one thing that is very powerful. One thing. Regardless of how much money you make, regardless of what political affiliation, regardless of your age, your ethnicity, your religion, we all have one thing that's very powerful. That's called choice. And individuals, not just in terms of how they choose to vote, but how they choose to spend their time to both listen, engage, and speak. So in some senses, if you think about the most powerful brands on earth today and the business that seem to be succeeding and the dynamics of success, it starts with simplicity. How can you be more simple and at the same time know that simplicity is not easy? It comes from having a sophisticated platform behind you that helps you deliver messages, concepts, strategies, and results in very simple ways. Think about Google. You type in a word, it tells you everything you need to know. Pretty simple. Behind that are the most sophisticated algorithms ever developed. So I like to make a reference that's going to stick with you, and maybe not in a great way, because you're going to wake up and go, did that guy really say that? Do you remember the mullet haircut? Yeah, let's go back to the mullet, right? What did it say? It said, business in the front, party in the back, right? Do you remember that? Well, today's modern mullet should be simple on the front, sophisticated in the back, right? I often get asked by startups, they say, James, what, what, what advice would you give a startup? And I'd say, well, here's simple advice, not just for a startup, but I think for life. Have you ever been in a position where you've been super impatient, and that impatience led to a, a result that didn't quite go how you expected, and you look back and go, ah, oh, I was impatient. And then there's that situation where you say, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, it'll all be good, and then it wasn't good, and you go, I should have done something sooner. Who's been in both of those positions? <laughs> All of us. So I think getting this balance right of being patiently aggressive. There are times to exercise elements of patience, and there are times then when that window of opportunity is open to strike, to be aggressive in terms of the desired result you're trying to achieve. And if you get this balance right, you'll find that the levels of respect for your leadership go up because you're okay to hold back in certain moments, and then when you have to lean in, you lean in and you take control and you actually move it towards the result you're trying to achieve. So think about it in terms of being patiently aggressive. 
and show me a startup, show me a brand, show me a business, show me a country over time that's exercised patience to make things happen, and then when windows of opportunity open, take advantage, and I'll show you a higher level of success and a track record of results that's better. When it comes to the journey, you're here to understand what's expected of us and of you and of all of us, and you have to deliver against what's expected. Managing expectations, I've found, is really critical. But there are certain times and certain dynamics that occur that are unexpected. And those are the moments where the magic happens. Sometimes they're crisis situations that need response. Sometimes they're just positive dynamics that you didn't expect, and when you get it, you take advantage of it. And I can tell you on my journey, just delivering meeting and hopefully exceeding expectations is now the norm for all of us. We're expected to do that. Do what we say. But when those moments, those unexpected moments come up and that spotlight is on you as a leader, did you take the right course of action to set better conditions for success in the unexpected moment? Whether it was a crisis or whether it was something positive that was happening. And ask yourself, are you ready, not just for the expected, but for the unexpected? And finally, this is the one that I believe is really most relevant. For me, in my experience, building brands, businesses around the world, I'm expected to create value. And not just economic value, value for individuals as employees, as contributors, as leaders, value for communities and countries and for customers and partners. We're expected to create value. But you often get this contradiction sometimes that says, are you there to create value or are you gonna hold true to your values? And again, over time, the dynamic balance of those two will turn into success over time. Being grounded in your values, our values, but Levi's are simple. It's around courage. It's around originality, integrity, and empathy. And we hold ourselves to those values, and we then have a concept of delivering profits through our principles, and guess what? We create value through holding true to our values. Canada is in an ideal situation with amazing values earned, honed, respected, and understood over time, and it has an opportunity to create value economically, environmentally, culturally, for communities, and for the country. Creating value through delivering against your values is the right balance. So as you go on your journey and you think about turning moments into momentum, Think about what you're going to face. Think about the dynamics of the obstacle course turning into the opportunity course, the possibilities that turn into scenarios. Think about the dynamics of setting up your strategies to actually turn into results in the short term and for the long term. And if you think about what it's going to take, you'll find that over time, Turning those moments into momentum is a powerful force. It starts with an intersection, a conversation. It starts with an idea. It can either be a moment that was missed and passed, and you go, I wish I would have, could have, or you take that moment and you turn it into momentum. As a proud Canadian, I look forward to all of you turning moments into momentum for the future. Thank you.